Hi, Laura. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. I'm so heartened to see uh, what K-12 Climate Action, that, that movement, it's wonderful. So we've got 50 million children in the U.S. who attend public schools, or at least they did before coronavirus. Now I'm wondering, the number's probably adjusted. But basically it comes down, it means that 480,000 diesel school buses, 7 billion meals are served annually. as And the nation is facing basically some of the most intense consequences of climate change right now. Just look out your window, it's there. It's time that we reconsider the way education, uh, the sector, plays a role in the climate crisis. And that is what you are doing. Laura Shifter, Senior Fellow with the Aspen Institute's Energy and Environment Program. You're leading the K-12 Climate Action Initiative. Laura, can you talk about what that initiative is? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we just recently launched K-12 Climate Action, and the goal of our initiative is really to unlock the power of the education sector to be a force toward climate action solutions and environmental justice. And um, what we're doing is we're bringing together people who um, are deeply immersed in the education sector and immersed in the environment sector, but maybe haven't worked at the intersection of these issues. Um, and we're getting them together to learn about the needs and opportunities to push schools towards climate action mm -hmm. um, and to develop an action plan to help support schools in moving in this way. I'm um, assuming that this was uh, this plan was in the works before the coronavirus happened. Is there something specifically special about this moment in time that you might be able to use to leverage the work that you're trying to do? Yeah, so I think... Um, there are a couple of things that we see um, all over the country right now. One of those being that our school systems are not very well equipped to handle learning disruptions. I think a lot of parents that are at home right now um, have experienced the fact that this transition to remote learning has been tough, to say the least. And one of the things that we know is that um, climate impacts have already disrupted schools across the country, and that will only continue to grow in the years to come. So, And actually, what we're talking about here when it comes to climate impacts, we're talking about, obviously, uh, larger expanded hurricanes in the Gulf. We're talking about fires in California. What other things should be on people's awarenesses that might not be those, you know, enormous worldwide stories? Well, one of the most common um, natural disasters occurring across the country are floods. And actually, um, there's a huge number of schools that are located in flood zones. And when floods happen, they may not make the news in the way that wildfires or hurricanes do, but they impact a lot of children and youth and families across this country. And so we need to think about that. Mm. Um, issues around food security. We know that our food system will be impacted by climate change, too. And so thinking about how to um, even address the fact that our schools are serving a lot of meals for kids is going to be important as we think about climate impacts ahead too. So K-12 through K Climate Action uh, approaches the impact of public schools on climate from multiple angles, from the material impact of school infrastructure to the curriculum that's being taught. Why is it important to come at this from all those angles? Well, when you do this work best, it's important to do it holistically. And ultimately, if you're addressing sustainability within the school system, if you're putting solar panels on the roofs, if you're um, transitioning to electric vehicles, that can be a learning opportunity for kids in the classroom. They can learn about the type of energy that the school is producing. They can do applied math to calculate the amount of energy they're putting on the grid. They can help construct in career and technical education classes, the batteries that will help store clean energy. So if you don't look at it holistically, you're missing an opportunity to really help support children and youth in advancing a more sustainable society in the future. We're talking about buses. Can you talk about what um, you're looking to do in terms of the busing and, and how might that impact our environment? So there are 480,000 school buses across the country. The vast majority of those are diesel buses. Um, and one of the things that we need to do is we need to transition that fleet to um, using clean energy to run and electric vehicles are gonna be a great opportunity for our school bus system. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing is we're actually 
learning about where districts have transitioned to electric school buses and trying to figure out um, how we can support more districts in doing this work to not just reduce the environmental footprint of the school system, but also lead to cleaner air for kids to breathe. Um, I remember riding on the school bus and not wanting to ride in one particular area because it smelled <laughs> of the diesel. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I had a bad bus, but you know, you're picking up kids on the street, letting them off into a cloud of diesel. It's It's got to be a health issue as well as an environmental issue. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So that's wonderful. Um, what does the education sector offer the climate movement, you know, traditional methods of how, of change like lobbying and grassroots activism doesn't? So I think the education sector, you know, nearly one in every six Americans is actually in public schools. Um, so the education sector is a huge sector. Um, and one of the things besides being a huge sector and, and being in, you know, most households across the country um, is that there's also an opportunity that when you help support students in learning about this information, they go home and they teach their parents. And so there's a spillover effect too. Um, which the reach of the education sector might not be the reach that the climate movement has um, fully embedded. So actually leveraging um, the number of people in the education sector can be a powerful thing for people in the climate movement. Are, as well. are there, is there talk within um, the, the action of uh, making schools, you know, with a zero carbon footprint or making schools run on solar, anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. There are net zero schools across the country and they use, you know, some use solar, some use geothermal, some use both um, to help ensure that they're net zero. And one of the things that you see when schools are net zero is they actually save uh, the district's money because the second highest cost for school districts across the country right now are energy. And so actually reducing that cost for schools ensures that more money goes towards teaching and learning. Ah, so this can appeal to uh, the budget conscious side of our, uh, you know, our pol pol body politics and also the um, care about the environment side who somehow seem to be on, you know, they're not on opposite sides, but the, the divisions that, that would keep uh, that, you know, the rhetoric that keeps, uh, keeps environment from being able to really take hold is, you know, that it's going to cost money to change a diesel bus to, a, you know, a, an electric bus and how are we going to pay for it? Yeah. And it's all, I mean, this will all have cost savings. So running electric buses, they do have a higher upfront cost, but they actually then save districts money um, throughout the year. And actually another thing that we've seen too, is they can be used uh, for communities to help build resilience for communities. So if you have a net zero school building and there needs to be a power outage because of a storm or something like that, um, community members can actually go to that school building to charge their iPhone. And put, plug in their phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when the power would go out and we had no phones. I just, you know, I guess I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how can our viewers get involved and support K-12 uh, climate action? So we are developing this action plan right now. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to hear from people across the country. We want to hear from people about what they think schools should do. Um, and so we'd encourage people to go to k12climateaction.org um, and tell us what they think schools should do. Um, help K twelve uh, climate action org. Here's an idea and a question wrapped in an idea wrapped in a question. Will there be any work um, on things like I know climate change is the major environmental focus, but the cleaning supplies that are often used in schools are like the most toxic ones, and there are greener solutions uh, to that. Would that be um, something that K twelve climate action would work on? Yeah, that's something that we're um, we're kind of learning about all of these issues, and we've built a coalition of organizations to help inform that work. And a lot of those um, organizations in the coalition focus on healthy schools, and a big part of healthy schools are are thinking about what the cleaning supplies are, what's the um, inside air quality in our school systems, what you know, what are our children breathing in, what are they drinking, 
How um, are they controlling the weeds? Is it with glyco- glyphosate, the thing that causes cancer, especially in children? I mean, you yeah. know, there's a lot to it. That's This is an excellent project, and I'm really glad that you came on to talk to us about it. I'm sure, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the food, the school food is an area uh, where we could green up a little bit. What What would be on the docket for that? So there are three kind of points of entry when thinking about school food. There's where we get our food from um, that that cafeterias then serve, and so then what children are eating, and then actually what happens when children don't finish all their food. So all of those points have um, areas where we can green. So thinking about how do we ensure that we have locally sourced food um, in school cafeterias, that we're not trekking food all across the country to get into our cafeterias, and how do we then ensure that people Um, who are sourcing our food are using sustainable practices. Um, Another thing is, you know, ensuring that kids are eating healthier food in schools. And I have a great idea. How about every school, if they have a a yard, they could make a farm in it, grow the food for the school. Good. Yeah, that's one of the things that we've looked at is school gardens and the use of school gardens. Um, Both help (laughs) teach kids more about um, sustainable food and also can help provide food for the cafeteria, which is great. This is terrific. Thank you so much for joining us today. The project is K-12 Climate Action. K-12ClimateAction.org. Is that correct? Where people can go to climateaction.org. Yep. Excellent. We've been, uh, you can, we've been speaking with Laura Shifter from the Aspen Institute. Laura is a senior fellow there and uh, leading the K-12 Climate Action Initiative. You can follow Laura at LA Shifter 12 on Twitter. Thanks so much, Laura. I appreciate you coming on and I look forward to hearing more about this project. It is wonderful to have some great news about things moving forward in the right direction. So thanks again for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. You're watching ACT TV. I'm Juliana Forlano. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That helps, right? It helps to keep us going when you subscribe and share and like. All right, that's it for today. We will be back tomorrow with guess who's coming on the show tomorrow. Naomi Wolf. Yes, the Naomi Wolf, author of The Beauty Myth, progressive feminist author, journalist, and former political advisor to Al Gore and Bill Clinton. Stay with us uh, for that tomorrow. Plus, there'll be more news. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.